I'm recording here. So if you try and record, I think it will give me a, a note and I'll have to allow it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, you should be recording on your side too. All right, Lauren, here we go. Okay. Ben, how are you doing, mate? Very well, thank you. Nice to be here. Well, thanks for coming on and thank you to the... Uh, the uh, the Bitcoin Twitter pleb that put us together and uh, said you got to get Ben on the show and and hopefully Marty will get back to you as well because he runs a show out in the US uh, Bitcoin focused podcast as well but very much down the uh, the rabbit hole of of what's actually going on behind the scenes you know and he's had Whitney Webb on many many times and she's doing great work over there and um, it's definitely yeah. something. We need to be talking more about. So as this unfolds, I, I urge everybody to, to stick with it. Really very interesting topics here. Uh, so as is custom, Lauren will ask you the first question. Who are the Rush, the, the Rothschild family? <laughs> Who are they? So they are, um, they are a, a, an old aristocratic family. Um, and they... A kind of a, a mythical family like when people talk about them it's almost as if they don't exist like they're they're, they're kind of hidden away from public sight and um it, a lot of the time even bringing them up gets you accused of being a, a conspiracy theorist or someone who believes in crazy stories about, about the way that the world is that have got no basis in reality but they are actually very real. They um, they sit. One of them currently sits in the House of Lords, which is our upper house of Parliament in in, in the UK, and um, they have business interests mainly in banking, but also across media, energy, pharmaceuticals, uh, the the weapons industry, and they're most famous for their control of the central banks the people who print the fiat currency that uh, bitcoin is a potential counter to because the ability to print money and their control of that system gives them a huge amount of power and it's power that they use behind the scenes in private out of the public eye and away from, importantly, our democratic processes, uh, which are supposed to protect us and to make sure that the people who make decisions about our society are held accountable and they do things for the benefit of the collective. But because of the way that the Rothschild system runs and the way that their reputation is protected in the media and by politicians and in fact their existence is often denied outright even though we know they exist they're able to operate in the background and to pull the strings and um they've been doing that for for a very 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 long time indeed certainly hundreds of years maybe thousands of years actually uh and um i think because of a couple of things one because of this plan that they have it's not just them but they're certainly at the center of it to to bring in a a, a world government a one world government um and and that plan is is uh, getting to the late stages of its implementation so a lot, a lot of the things that you would have seen around you that luckily because you're being homeschooled you've actually been sheltered from a lot of the the, the worst of the craziness that's been happening out here as that has um, progressed to its natural conclusion or unnatural conclusion, it might be a way of describing it. And because of the technologies that we now all have access to, so like the internet and, you know, the fact that you and I can sit here and have this conversation with each other and you're probably a few, I don't know exactly where you are, you're probably a few hundred miles away from me and we can talk instantly um, and we can capture video on our phones and we can share information much more easily and readily between us as individuals in the population. Um, so because their plan is becoming more advanced and because more people are aware of it now and are able to talk about it and share information with each other and kind of um, get away from the centralized 
uh, narrative, which was led by people like the BBC and the newspapers and those other channels that um, the Rothschilds have got quite a, a, a lot of control over, um, they are being pulled out into the light now and we can see them and uh, we can put the join the dots together between the different parts of their plan and um we are living through a moment where not just the Rothschilds but anyone really involved in trying to bring in a single world government and to um subjugate the whole of humanity because that's what that's designed to do um they are uh they're, they're being exposed and held accountable or they will be that's where we're heading to next that's, um, yeah that that's what <laughs> conversations like this hopefully will will help people understand lauren so, yeah. do you think there's like other families like the Rothschild out there there are definitely other elite they call themselves elite so they think that they're above everybody else right and that's that's really telling like when you when you hear people describing themselves as elites and you do and there are a lot of people who do that um certainly in london where i am um then then you, you have to you have to pay attention because it means that they think that they're separate and above and better but they're not really not um and there's there are lots of elite families really every country that you go to around the world and one of the reasons that they've been able to um uh pro progress their plan which basically involves them having control over every single nation on earth is because there are families generally who, who are well established in each of those countries and have been compromised and corrupted by their relationship with the Rothschild amongst other things um and they're they're all over the place actually there's there's lots of families like that um luckily there's a lot more of us than there are of them and that's the thing that I think is is uh, starting to uh, become really apparent to to, to the people at, at, the, at the top of this system is that, um, you know, the, the vast kind of swell of humanity is, is billions of people. But the people running this system that they've designed, uh, I think it's probably I think it's probably no more than about 10, 15, 20,000 people internationally. Who are actually running the, the show in this um in this new world order and a lot of that is linked into as i said um elite families so they're out there any other questions uh no <laughs> yeah well that's a lot to take in already <laughs> and i know <laughs> It's been a lot for me to take in. And, uh, ben and I are going to talk about it in, uh, in a second. So. Last class in like 10 minutes. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you go for on, your um, question. Thank yeah. you. Go and get ready for your maths. And uh, yeah, say goodbye to Ben. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Right. Cheers, mate. Lauren. Um, okay. Right. That was to, great. To set this up, I suppose. Uh I'm a 47-year-old white bloke, spent 18 years in financial markets, in foreign exchange markets, of all things. Uh, thought I was on the uh, the right path. You know, I was doing the whole 2.4 kids, white picket fence, saving for the future, until something, you know, woke me up. It was a, a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Work Week. And um, ever since then, my life has been taking uh, a huge change over the last 10 years and discovering Bitcoin uh, and now I find myself, uh, because I followed the money, I find myself at the same conclusions that you're coming to. And uh, I've, you know, I've surrounded myself in books here, and I hope to dive into some notes um, just to, you know, kind of um, pull all of this thing out. But that, you know, that framing, I, I just want people to understand that, like you say, if you bring up that name Rothschild, you are completely and utterly, totally cancelled within seconds. This is such a psychological uh, a psyop that has been um, perpetrated against us as a whole. Because I used to be one of those people, 
I used to be one of the eye rollers. Whenever, whenever anybody would say, oh, did you know that? You know, I'm like, oh my God, yeah, whatever, man. You know, what, I've got to be at my desk at 6.30 in the morning. I come out for a beer. I'm not talking about this. See you later. Um, so let's let's get a little bit about you because uh, from I, I listened to you on um, James Delling uh, Paul's podcast and you've had a... Uh, a career like you i think you're probably around the same kind of age um you, yeah you're not coming from a deep conspiratorial background in fact you've come out of nowhere and started writing about this kind of stuff so yeah what... pretty, pretty much yeah yeah um so so i spent um i'm a little bit younger than you so i'm 42 um englishman um uh uh worked in um studied english and philosophy at university and kind of left without a particular idea of what i wanted to do and got into agency like creative agency world um you know marketing communications design that kind of stuff and then basically worked my way up through a career in in agencies and then more into management and strategic consulting particularly around digital digital innovation and digital transformation and the the, the that kind of wave from 2007 8 9 that's still going now but i kind of stepped out of it about two or three years ago of the wholesale transformation of whole swathes of industrial activity economic activity through the deployment of primarily um computers laptops desktops but really it was mobile mobile was the big the big driver of change and um and helping companies navigate their way through that kind of paradigm shift think about how to take the services that they were delivering whatever whatever that might be and this was happening across every single part of society right whether it was in banking media healthcare retail uh, everything has been touched on by digital so in that period of time i worked across you know probably 60 70 percent of of the industry sectors out there um and helping them think about how do you take the services you're currently delivering transform them to be delivered through digital technology from a from a user perspective i.e how does your customer interface with it but then also on the back end what does that do to you operationally commercially like how do you need to restructure your organization uh in order to deliver this new technological future on an ongoing basis basically um and um and did that a, a pretty high level so i was in a boutique design firm that was a, like a leader in um human centered design and uh, which was like the really the way to do the work that we were doing is about placing the user and their needs and their behaviors at the center of your process when you're thinking about how to do service delivery kind of intuitively makes sense but a lot of companies don't think like that um and that 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 was a really good little business that got bought by one of the big global consulting firms and then integrated into that firm so I, i'd spent most of my time in independent agencies and consultancies but then there was a chunk of time that i was in one of the really big corporates uh one of the one of the big four consulting firms um and and that was that was probably where i got my, most of my insight into the the inner workings of 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 the system basically and that that was based here in london uh the their office was in the city um you, uh, and you know we were doing a lot of work around the banking system um but as i say across all the other sectors as well and and then it's around 2019 2020 there was a whole bunch of stuff going on and it was mainly the cultural stuff really it was like the if you, you know you'll be familiar with this like you go back to the 90s we, we didn't have all of this sort of um this this angst and uh and, and um and com like just running conflict in society on a constant basis you know like in our cultural conversation it become really combative and i couldn't work out why that was so i kind of really 
went down the rabbit hole on the culture war side of things to understand where all of the, these these critical theories and you know this frankly like you know anti male anti white anti western ideologies had infected our education system the media the political discourse they're absolutely everywhere it's like okay well how is this happening and and who is it serving you know like who's actually benefiting from this and then and then um and i'd already kind of sort of started to wake up around that uh and then and then and then the, the covid phenomenon hit and um i've been spending a lot of time really up close to the health system particularly looking at their, their their technology strategy. So like the future of the NHS, what's it going to be like in 10 years time? What are the new roles that are going to emerge? How are these advanced technologies going to be deployed like AI and automation and these huge data sets we're going to have access to and genomics and, you know, that kind of genetic engineering that they really want to get into that's being positioned as the future of medicine and all that kind of stuff. And I was really up close to that, and I, and then basically it just be it, 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 I just started to see the components of uh, a, a control grid. Basically, I mean that's essentially what we've been subjected to. This the and and the, the digital technology. So I spent a long time helping people to 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 to, to deploy um, in the wrong hands, and unfortunately they are in the wrong hands. Um, they're potentially very dangerous. And they give the people who control those systems an absolutely unacceptable and an unparalleled level of control, uh, 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 knowledge, access to data and information about each of us individually, mm. as well as the you know the companies we work for and, and all that kind of stuff. And and. Um, I'm thinking and, now, like my, I'm going straight to this track and trace app. This is where my mind yeah. is going in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. and there are so many unanswered questions around that, but so many people were downloading that thing and were accepting the, the text messages and the SMSs and the push notifications and all of this. So did you do any kind of deep dive into, into that? And because I know one of the big four, were helping them implement that. And one of the scandals were they were getting paid thousands of pounds per day, I think, just to be on some kind of retainer in air quotes. Yeah, so, I mean, that was a real gravy trade, the the COVID app. I can't remember the exact numbers that they spent on it, but um, I I'll think it was in the- search whilst you're, bet, whilst you're talking about it. Well, it's, it's, diff- it's difficult to extract from, from what I remember. You might be able to find some info, but like the- it was a component of the, the the test and trace program. The test and trace program itself was thirty seven billion quid that they spent a, in like a year that on really no one knows what. It was just crazy. But I, I think the app was a component of that. Um, but they certainly spent uh, probably a hundred times as much money as you would need to to actually build something like that, right? And that's just classic NHS and classic big consultancy. Like they just they over engineer everything and they're really bad at digital actually um because it allows you to would be the consulting fleet. firms do that purposefully is that kind of like the, the the kind of business plan i mean the incentives are as we already know are completely misaligned because you're dealing with a fiat currency but is that yeah. the kind of are you trained in one of those big four to milk the cash cow in every single corner of that that deal they don't train you to do that per se, but the incentives are set up in a way which which leads to that kind of behaviour. Ultimately, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, to be a, a partner in a big firm, um, it's much better for you to sell a fifty million pound program of work that doesn't deliver anything to the client, and that happens all the time, right? Like these huge programs of work, loads of money spent, and they don't move the needle at all, right? It happens everywhere. Uh, and then they'll sell another one like three months later. Like it's it's it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so the, there's an incentive. There's there's more of an incentive for you as a partner to sell a big program that actually ultimately doesn't deliver any value than there is to sell a a, a much smaller program that would actually do something useful, right? Because you you just you've got the, all the teams of people. You've got the 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 global office network, like all of the overheads. Um, all of the, those partners floating around on you know a million pound plus a year and you've got to keep 
you've got to keep feeding the beast, right? So, you know, they're, they're, they're certainly incentivized to, to make the programs as big as possible. They're, and, you know, obviously they talk about being client focused and, um, and and delivering value and all that kind of sort of stuff, yada, yada, yada. But, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they always find ways to basically they armor plate everything, you know, like they're rather than just having the, 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 the what is it that Jeff Bezos talks about? You want a two pizza team, right? You, your team of people building your digital product, you should be able to feed them with two pizzas. That's that's like a, a, a rule of thumb from inside Amazon. And they know how to scale digital platforms, right? Better than anybody. So if you've got a two pizza team, there that that that's not something that you're necessarily going to find inside like a Deloitte or something like that. I think it was Deloitte who actually did the 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 the, the test and trace app ultimately, uh, with a whole bunch of other people in there as well. But I believe that they took it. They 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 did the the lion's share of the delivery work. Um and because they 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 um they they'll just they'll build they'll build a whole load of additional stuff into it just to to bulk it up and make it feel more substantial and a lot of the time particularly if you're dealing with a client like the nhs they kind of need that so that otherwise the the the, the two pizza team just gets absorbed and lost by the just the huge creaking ridiculous bureaucracy that surrounds the project so in order for them as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a corporate bureaucratic institution to 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 engage with and understand the, the program and work that's being delivered it almost kind of needs to be huge you see what i mean there's a there's, mm. a, there's a mindset thing there and that and, and that's not an excuse by the way that's 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 a failing of the nhs as much as anything else um but yeah they the, so the the, the 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 app was that was ridiculous like the, i mean as we know in hindsight uh the COVID is was essentially a flu type illness, yeah, like at best. Um, so it, it, and we've had that for I don't know the whole of human history. Like we've never had to do all the things that we did supposedly needed to do in in response to COVID at any point before. So I don't understand why now we now need to do all of this stuff and spend all of this money and have all of this fear and anxiety and, and um, these, the, these sort of draconian measures foisted on us because of something that when you just go and look at the raw data, we know is, a, is, 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 is on a par with something that's happened every year, like forever, you know, this is completely unprecedented. So it, there was no need for it in the first place. Then the idea that you would that you would want to and can and should and are able to track the movements and interactions of everyone everywhere constantly is so pathologically evil and 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 strange. It's like I don't understand how that could have been formulated and signed off by anyone who's, you know, in in a, in a, in a in a in a normal state of mind. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, um, it's absolutely crazy. And then and then when they when they rolled it out, I mean, a big chunk of the the uh, the the issue, you know, people talk about this NHS backlog. Oh, we got this NHS backlog, and a lot of that was to do with only treating COVID. Right, so they shut off treatment for all, everything other than COVID during the, uh, that period of about a year or two years, right? So there was a backlog created by that. But then also because of the way that the app works, I don't know if I don't know if you remember this term, the pingdemic. Yeah. So there, yeah, the pingdemic. That's like one of the stupidest things that's ever happened, right? It's like you've got this digital app that's not very accurate that's tracking. <laughs> social interactions of people to to monitor their their potential exposure to the flu and then we're just going to have this whole crazy um set of uh it's basically like an early warning system right but it was just going off constantly and the, the amount of people inside the nhs who were being sent home told to self-isolate like it just decimated the workforce and not because they were ill it's because the app was telling them that they needed to do it because of some potential risk further down the line. But it was absolutely, it's, it's just, it's, it's craziness, absolute craziness. So for, for and, international listeners, let, let's try and um, paint a picture of what this thing was. You had to download the app uh, up. What, what, would, what data would you actually upload to it? I never, I never downloaded it. So I don't know, but I mean, right. it, it, it was, it was, you know, Personal information, 
about mm. who you were. So you are identifiable as an individual. Uh, and then there was you would check in to locations. That's right. If you walked yeah, into a bar or a cafe or even a shop sometimes, whatever, there was yeah. a QR code on the front panel yeah. of the door and you would have to check in to that location yeah. to say, I have been here. Exactly, yeah. And then if someone reported that they came down with the code, the dreaded C, uh, who had also been in that location and had checked in, then everyone who had been there would get notified. <laughs> and then it would just be, and then everywhere else that they'd been, there would be no, it was just this like, ding, 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 yeah. just crack. Absolutely, I remember crazy. Pe people were loving it, mate. They were, oh, I've just been pinged. I've just been pinged. I've got to stay home. Stay home, save yeah, lives. You're like, yeah, what? Yeah, like, right. Well, it, it turns out there's a lot of people that they're, they're very compliant and or very lazy because there's a lot of people, I think, who were just loving, like, oh, you know, I basically saw it as like a bit of a holiday, you know, like, mm. oh, we'll get, we'll get the furlough and, you know, I'll just stay in for six months and that'll be fine. And, you know, it was, it was, it was really a remarkable time. I remember I've been digging back through some of the videos that I downloaded back then, of, you know, that people on the BBC talking about the drama and uh, how, you know, the daily death rate and all of this stuff. It's like, oh, what does it, everyone, everyone just seems to kind of be brushing that under the carpet. Like, they don't want to engage with the fact that that actually happened for two years in the in the immediate in our immediate history and the people who try to perpetrate that that fraud yeah it's, it's a complete and utter and outright fraud not just against the british people but against the global populace yeah it's because this happened everywhere they're all still running the governments mm -hmm. but so like you know the people running the health system today you know and, and not even the politicians like the people in the top level of um of of, of the nhs uh, and the people running, you know, the MHRA, the regulator, the 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 the, the, the vaccines, the, the vaccines onto the market in record time, and um, you know, the people, uh, uh, you know, in in the senior levels of like the the BMA, uh, BMJ, and, and and the BMA and the GMC, and like all the regulatory bodies, they're all the same people, and they they're not being held accountable at all. Right. Um, so you start going down this rabbit hole when you start seeing like this overreach into people's personal data and some of the messaging that's coming out. Uh, so you, you, your ears are pricked, right? Uh, around 2020, as this is all starting to um, to unroll. So yeah, yeah, my ears, my ears are pricked up, and more than that, I was, I was like by about you know April May time, I, I was fully down, fully down the rabbit hole. Uh, and I was getting a lot of information out of Telegram. Telegram is a good place to go to get to get information, particularly from the US. Were you still working at this point at, at one of those uh, big four consultancies? No, so I got out of that. It's really right. interesting timing, actually. Like I got out of that at the start of 2019. So I, I, I was in one of the big firms, and basically I did two and a half years there. And but the the, the big global corporate culture was not for me like i just didn't fit in like the at all um so i kind of i got out did did another year in in another boutique firm but then they decided to sell to one of the other big firms as well so i was like okay well i don't i don't want to go through that process again so i'm going to go off and i'm going to go and work in the health system for a bit and went to work for a medical technology company uh, which is where i i got to find out a lot about what was going on inside mm. the nhs um and then when covid hit i'd actually stepped away from that and was doing a consulting gig and and and, ha and had plans to go and do some stuff in the music industry so like my timing of going into music in uh basically february 2020 was like the worst possible timing you can imagine so there was a whole period of about a year where i was just scraping around doing various bits and pieces but um and i had quite a lot of time on my hands actually Right. So that was that was really helping with my research. And then I was doing consulting gigs as well through um, in, in, until uh, about August, September 2021. But then that the, the last couple of consulting gigs I did, one of them in particular was what really flipped me out of the of the system completely, because essentially I, I got um, and this is why I've, I've done. You mentioned an interview I've done with James Dedimpo. I've done mm. two now. 
I did one which we, I think we're going to come on to, which was which was recently, which was um, uh, with the Rothschilds figure, and that's that's I think where the first question that that, of, that Lauren uh, Jobs uh, came from. But then the first interview I did with James is back in April, and that was to talk about uh, an organisation called Genomics England. Mm. And Genomics England is a uh, government-owned and operated uh, uh, data platform where they store genetic data for large parts of the population. They're they're pushing up towards 5 million people, and they want to get a full population data set for the UK, and then... Ultimately, they'll be looking to expand that internationally as well. They want to be a global leader in genomics. And when you understand what genomics is, and like I said earlier, it's talked about as, as the future of medicine. When you get into it, it's 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 pretty grim actually. Like it's it's you know for me it's um it's it's it, it's I think it's evil. I think you know the idea well, it's eugenics, can... right? There's no it's, other yes, way. Just... yeah. It, it, exactly what it is they've rebranded it for the 21st century yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) it's basically there are things that we 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 can we can manipulate your genetic code in order to make you better Mm. as a human being and 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 they talk you know as with all these things it's like with you know anything like central bank digital currency the bank of england you're going to talk to them about cbdc they'll they'll paint you a big old long picture about how fantastic it is and how efficient and all that kind of stuff and you get the same message coming out of the health system for things like genomics. But then it's like, okay, well, um, what about what about all everything else that's going on around it, right? So we we you know, like you've you've had this um we've we've just lived through this COVID situation, right? And you you've spent an inordinate amount of money building a digital control grid to to really brutally subjugate and terrorize the population you know as as the health system right the nhs has been right at the forefront of trying to scare the, the daylight living daylights out of people on a daily basis right, the, the, they spent millions on an advertising yeah. budget campaign yeah. to plaster bus yep. stops with posters with like you know hired these actors to i, I mean they had elton john and michael kane like, yeah, they. The you know, if people are, out, if they yeah. if they want to like literally <laughs> just sit back for one second and say, "Huh, they have a marketing budget. Our national health system has a marketing that doesn't make any sense." So you're paying tax to that institution, apparently, because God knows yeah. where all the black hole of all the money goes for your safety, for your health. But yeah. then they spend a, po- a portion of that to scare the living wits out of uh, you know anyone. Yeah, they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is rooted in um, uh, neurolinguistic programming and right. the, the the activities of um, something called the nudge unit, basically, which you might be familiar with, which is now called the Behavioral Insights Team. Is and that, that that probably has direct links to the Tavistock Institute, I would imagine. Yeah, they're all yes, mm. yes, yeah. This is Tavistock's very much involved in a lot of this stuff as well um and uh and so so actually when you look at in like the the context of what the nhs is actually doing how unaccountable a lot of the spend is right because the, the amount of money they have you know we hear this constantly oh the nhs is is underfunded it's like no it's not it's got too much money it's got far too much money yeah you could probably do uh, and, you know, and you, you are you aware i think it was april 2020 that all UK hospitals had a debt jubilee. Like all debt was wiped off of all UK hospitals. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. That was a bombshell I heard listening to a Doc Malik podcast with uh, an NHS insider. Uh, so you'd have to right. go back and, and find that one. And, you know, when she dropped that, I was like, yeah. what? So sure enough, I hit the internet and went to Google it and find it. And like, yeah, it's there. It's written. I yeah. don't remember that being a big fanfare thing and everybody talking about it because, you know, if you write off all of that debt and the funding still keeps coming, you are correct. They are completely and totally overfunded. They've got money. That, it's a, lo- a use it or lose it budget, right? That's why someone's happy to spend 50 billion on a freaking mm. trace and track, a track and trace app, which they're not even hiding. It's in the title, track and trace. Like yeah. wake the fuck up, people! Seriously, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, this uh, the the and that that that's that mentality is, is is rife across the whole of the health system. And actually, so the the guy that I uh, the last consulting gig that I did that I mentioned, where I was talking to the guy that, that actually runs or he did run, he's just been moved on from the CEO position of Genomics England. But I was talking to him about the program. Had two conversations with him about what they were up to. And one of the things I remember was in basically saying, yeah, it was is that you got to use it or lose it mentality. So I think that they had, they had like, what was it? I'm sure it was like 30 million a week or something like that. You know, wow. which is a lot of money, man. Like you, it's a, that's a lot of money a week to be spending on a program. The, My the, God. The, the, you know, and, that, and that's a tight, that, and it, you know, so the, the, their annual budget is about 1.5 bill, I think, for that program. I'm 99% sure of that. And these you genomics know, that... guys, uh, so I'm just going to read because it's on the government website here and you've linked to it on your website, um, M- yeah. MHRA and Genomics England to launch pioneering resource to better understand how genetic makeup influences the safety of medicines. Like, right, okay, so it's for your safety as usual, baked yes. into the title, right? Yeah. And then, uh, so has today, so the medicines and healthcare, this is the MH. RA, regulatory agency. Yeah, Most people like, probably didn't even know this existed. No, certainly not. No, I mean, and yeah, it's, 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 if you're familiar with the FDA in the United States, it's our equivalent of the FDA, basically, more or less. Um, they, so they, yeah, they're, they're the regulator for the for the life sciences market. Um, and they, yeah, they've been partnering with Genomics England. They're on about building a, a data structure to support the development of new medicines. And again, like, as you said, it's all about safety. But then when you understand what the MHRA has been doing for the past three years, it's like, okay, you've got no interest in safety at all. Mm-hmm. And actually they will, they will talk about themselves. Uh, and you see this absolutely everywhere as they talk about themselves as a market enabler. So when you you know if you if you if you if you've got a background in business and mm. you read and you read the, their strategy documents and their formal communications coming out from the the chief executive right this is Lady June Rain who's the chief executive of the MHRA when, and she she would talk about the fact that they're no longer a regulator they're a, they're a strategic partner to industry and they're a market enabler and their role is to reduce friction of getting uh new chemicals into the market i.e our bodies your your daughter's body potentially you know that's the way that they look at this stuff as quickly as possible with minimal intervention and 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 then when you dig it i mean well we, we go around the house a little bit here but like the but the mhra is interesting and 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 one document to go and read if you really want to understand what's going on in the health system is the best place to go is as ever it's just to go and listen to what the people running it are actually saying like what are they what are their actual published statements go and look at it and understand what that means and it's all lying around in the open right and there was in 2021 a document published called the life sciences vision and the life sciences vision is a world economic forum sanctioned document because it has the build back better Mm. phrasing written on the cover. Yes. This is a UK government strategic document um, from the desk of Boris Johnson, who at the time was the UK prime minister. So he signed it um, and it's got build back better on the cover. And it's also got the words build back better in Johnson's opening statement which has his signature underneath it in the in the first couple of pages of the document. And what that describes is a a, a, a hyper efficient, uh, fully digitized uh, 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 market platform, essentially for the for the pharmaceutical industry to develop innovative new medicines. It's all about Pharma, clinical intervention, using technology to more quickly and efficiently and profitably create and deploy these things into the market. And there is barely a mention of patients at all. And 
all of it is built on this assumption that we're going to progress into this 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 new paradigm of medicine, this genomics and uh, uh, DNA fueled uh, uh, um, paradigm of, of of medicine, um, and and that is all presupposed on the existence of these um, centralized data platforms that have every single last piece of information about you as an individual within them and 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 these are going to be um uh exist it already exists now so this is not like a potential future like the actual capabilities already been built as i said they've already got millions of people's genetic data on 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 this platform in the uk and there are similar things being built in the us there's a similar thing in in, in israel so netanyahu has spoken publicly about the fact that they've got one of these data platforms in israel it's one of the reasons that pfizer was willing to give the pfizer vaccine to israel first and there's a, a whole bunch of information around that um that, that, that's out there um and um you know and and, and and that's and that's and that's the nhs that's our health system it's been completely captured by by corporate interest and and you look at it you know the most telling stuff think about the about the nhs is like and, and the people running it if you look at look at where they actually invest their time and their, and their money and 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 where they try to build a case to 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 um to build things you know they they they're really really interested in um these future technologies and investing billions in creating these digital marketplaces that the pharmaceutical industry can operate in but then if you go to an NHS hospital the food that they serve like i I'm, I'm i'm a trustee of a health charity yeah and and we we describe NHS hospitals as obesogenic environments. So like you, you go into an NHS hospital, uh, then the food that you're able to access there, whether that's you as a visitor going to the Costa or W H Smith buying loads of bags of sweets or you know whatever it might be, or particularly if you're an inpatient in the hospital, what they serve you it actually makes you more sick mm -hmm. yeah like the food makes you ill and actually that and you can extend that further out from the nhs like if you look at our food system more broadly the the, the food that is allowed to be put onto our shelves a lot of it is it's, it's ultra processed it's hyper addictive it's full of like really bad ingredients uh loads of sugars loads of um these kind of weird chemicals that they're introducing now particularly around like fake meat and that kind of thing like mm -hmm. it's a really sort of industrial with product seed oils as well yeah exactly seed oils just like hang on a minute you could probably fix most like seriously you you could you could fix most of the chronic diseases that we see emerging in society in, with increasing regularity by by um fixing the food supply and a really good place to start doing that would be in nhs hospitals you should be leading by example but you're not you're actually making people more sick whenever they walk into a hospital and the people running the system aren't bothered about fixing that they're over there talking to Bill Gates and a whole bunch of other people about how to build a, a digital platform to store everyone's DNA data in. It's like mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the, the gap between the actual underlying problems that need to be fixed and what, what we're being told should be invested in and should be built is so completely, they're so vastly separated from each other that, you know, you could say, Maybe they're just a bit, you know, m misinformed and, you know, just silly bumbling politicians. They always get it wrong. But unfortunately, at this point, I'm much more cynical about it, but largely because of what I've seen with my own eyes happening on a daily basis in the health system. And and the conclusion you have to draw is that um, they, they, not only that they don't care that the NHS is making people sick, and it's that the, the they have actually structured it 
in order to do that and it's serving its function as far as they're concerned perfectly well you know? absolutely and I, I love the fact that they call this um well, it says here in the first line of this article, a brand new genetic research resource known as a bio bank. I mean, mm. it's so disgusting. Like, it's just really so bad. But there, there's extra little things going on right now. This this return of David David Cameron out of nowhere, right? And his well, he's, and, and... so we go on. Yeah, and his connection to all of this um, eugenic genomic kind of stuff which uh i'm sure you're up to date with. But if you could bring bring the audience up to speed of how and yeah, why so, he's involved well so he he there's a few things so first of all um he announced uh the the the, the creation of the precursor to genomics england at the 2012 olympic games so Cameron, when they had so, that ridiculous NHS um, thing in the yeah, opening ceremony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so once they so they'd psy opt everybody with the NHS, yes, uh, with I the NA, that. yeah, all the you know the, the 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 all the people on the beds and the, the and the spectre of death looming large in the stadium. I mean, some of that stuff is so creepy now. Looking back on it, yeah, um, that so was the beginning that, of a real psy op. You're right. Like that was absolutely yeah. uh, on a yeah, global yeah. stage. And I remember watching it thinking, mm. this is weird. And the narrator saying something along the lines of it was XYZ prime minister or something that said any country that does not have a free and open health system cannot be considered as a civilized country or something like that, you know, like All message right. to the world. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, yeah. They're really, they're really pushing state, healthcare i mean that that's that's the model that they would like everyone to adopt and you know you can hear it in the us uh, but we we've got one of the one of the more advanced ones um with, with the nhs and you know it, it's just with all this stuff it's, it was that phrase like the the road to hell is paved with good intentions and that's mm. really the nhs for me because everyone looks and go oh you can't criticize the nhs the nhs is there to protect us and to keep us healthy it's like maybe it might some of the people who work there might think that the people who structured the system and certainly people who run it now, they don't think that at all. And I can demonstrate that to you in a hundred different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of them is that David Cameron at the, um, the 2012 Olympics announced the something called, it was called a uh, hundred thousand genomes. That was it. It was the hundred thousand genome project, which ran um, until 2018. And then 2018, 2019, they 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 sequenced the hundred thousand genomes, and they basically said, right, we've done that. We're going to turn this from a, a single project into a into a, an ongoing platform, essentially a piece of structural capability that exists in the health system that uses this technology that will then create a marketplace. Ultimately, this is what this is, right? This is a marketplace for the pharmaceutical industry to operate in, a, a new marketplace, because they already have a marketplace to operate in inside the NHS, which is the £20 billion a year that the pharmaceutical industry gets paid every single year um, to fulfil all the prescriptions that have been pumped out into the population and that are causing a whole bunch of the health issues that we've got and a lot of early death and you know they've 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 got their they've got their, they've got their, their their filthy little mitts into into everything and you know that Cameron's been fully aware of that because he was prime minister but this has been going on for a long time Blair was certainly aware of it and um you know previous previous uh, leadership to that but what Cameron's been doing um around the genomics is he's very personally involved in it he, he actually lobbies. We certainly has been over the past few years. I don't know now as our new foreign secretary, bloody hell, where did that come from? Um, whether he's still doing this, but it's entirely possible that he is. Uh, but he was lobbying for uh, an American technology company called Illumina. Who are Doesn't in... get any more obvious. Yeah, I know, isn't it? <laughs> They're not trying to hide it. It's Illumina. a company called Illumina. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah. just missing the T and the I. It's just well, ridiculous. I, well, well, the Illuminati and the people who work there, I think that's what it is, right? So it's like the, the company's called Illumina. So if you work there, you're in the Illuminati. <laughs> Do you see what they did there? Yep. And so, so basically, he so he he personally intervened. as He was lobbying for them, getting paid 
I would imagine a significant wedge uh, to, to 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 represent their interests in the UK health system. And he personally introduced them to Matt Hancock when Hancock was uh, health secretary, and then they received a contract worth 120 million, I think it was. You know, so there was a direct link between those two things happening. And then also the Illumina technology underpins the whole genomics industry, basically. So um, any of these genomics uh, organizations uh, like Genomics England or, you know, counterparts in the US or Israel or wherever else it might be, a lot of what they're doing is run on the top of technology developed by Illumina. And Illumina is a fast, fascinating company. Yeah, I, they... I had to Google it and uh, do it just a little <laughs> bit of snooping around. Um, yeah, let's get into it. It was founded back in uh, the 90s, right? 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was. I'm not going to get the time right, timelines completely correct. But the, 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 there's two things that I think are particularly interesting with them. The first one is that they did the sequence of covid into in, in in early 2020 maybe even late 2019 yeah the the ceo uh, of of illumina a guy called francis de souza this and he's talked about this publicly right they talk about this is this is not me like riffing on some some blog post that someone's put somewhere on 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 a dark part of the internet this is like him talking at the world economic forum on stage explaining how how it all went down at the start of covid he basically said, I was in China in late 2019, early 2020, and we worked with the CCP to do the, the genomic sequencing of COVID, where we basically took their samples and data that they gave us about this virus. Yeah, this is from the, the Chinese government gave this to, to Illumina. They then took that and turned it, he, the way he describes it is you take a biological problem, you turn it into a software problem. Right. So basically they do their magic trick where they take the, the biological problem and they turn it into a piece of computer code. And then that piece of computer code was then used by Moderna and Pfizer to create their vaccines, their, their, their RNA vaccines with. So it's just that one guy working for that American technology company with his team around him, working directly with the Chinese government, which is a which is a vicious totalitarian dictatorship to create the, the 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 computer code that's then used by the 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 the, the, the main covid um well i don't i don't like to call it a vaccine because it's not a vaccine it's a genetic therapy and it's highly experimental and it's never been used in humans at mass scale before right so this is really just a big experiment um but but illumina we're right we're right at the heart of that yeah and then so so it's like okay well how how is this a good idea it is a, this just makes absolutely no sense, you know, and particularly when you look at their political connections to people like David Cameron, for example. But then also if you look on the Illumina board. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people on there. The ones that really jumped out at me were um, uh, Phil Schiller from Apple. Yeah. So there's a lot of these big tech people that are completely aligned with genomics in this emergent strand of medicine yeah um and and the souza himself is also on the board of disney yeah so you got you got disney apple um pfizer like big basically big anything big tech big big food big pharma big media big government they're all in this interconnected web of directorships and board positions and you know non-execs positions um are you aware that he he's just resigned in, in june who did the caesar yeah oh did he I, I wasn't aware of that yeah so just just happened right june um 2023 de souza announced his resignation effectively immediately following an aggressive board reorganization and ousting attempt from kyle carl Icahn. so right i i can was involved okay I can is trying to obviously, um, you know, do a little bit of his usual thing and aggressive yeah. uh, investing. Um, but one board member that really stood out for me was uh, Scott Gottlieb. Yes. Yeah. Former FDA commissioner. Yes, exactly. 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 I mean, right. 
come on. <laughs> that guy's fascinating, yeah. Because yeah. what was it? So he was FDA, and then he and then he left there, and he went straight to Pfizer. Yes. And he's also an Illumina. Yes. <laughs> so it's like the yeah, since there's, February there's... 2020. <laughs> ben, yeah. February 2020. I, I mean, know the time. The, the time. The timings. It's like oh, what a remarkable coincidence incredible that's not a coincidence like they, and before it, fda he had been uh, an investor and um in, in all of this biotech kind of stuff and whatever else and during during his time in the fda he has like this absolute like ridiculous long shopping list of of things that um they they were trying to push and achieve and uh you know ring fence and then yeah. he just hops straight it's the this the disgusting revolving door yeah, and actually, and, and and um, you know, the MHRA in the UK is basically operates on the same model of, as the FDA, right? I mean, yeah. so the, and, and actually, I seem to remember that they've introduced a, 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 some policy recently, which essentially says if the FDA approves something, then we will take that uh, as as almost as like tacit approval in the UK, like we'll follow their lead. So, like, okay, well, why do why does the UK not deserve its own regulator uh actually keeping an eye on what the pharmaceutical industry is trying to put into the health system why are you going to go just with what the americans um, are saying about it i mean that that's a very valid question but then also let's go and look at what the americans are actually doing and given that it's um i think it's something like 80 percent funded by the pharmaceutical industry for a start right so the people that you're supposed to be regulating are actually paying your bills at the fda um the and the same is largely true at the mhra as well um the given given the total catastrophic meltdown that we've seen with the covid vaccine program over the past three years yeah well, it's basically just total gross negligence across the board and 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 a lot and, and, and a lot of it not just negligence it's like criminal malevolence um and then and and then let's go look at the people running the fda and see what they're doing oh well look Look, Scott Godley, you know, he's essentially set the set the precedent for someone to be running the FDA to walk straight out the door onto the board of one of the one of the one of the biggest. Well, I think it might be the biggest global pharmaceutical company that he was supposed to be regulating. But like, this is this is crazy. It's absolute craziness. And the audacity of it and the idea that um, that they would be able to get away with it. Well, they have been getting away with this for quite a long time now um and and you see it it's, you know it's also happened in this country as well as a guy uh, jonathan van tam who was the de deputy chief medical officer in the uk one of one of the at one point one of the, the daily covid voices you know he was up there talking on the tv about what was going on and um you know he was he, he's he, he's got a lot of questions to answer van tam um and he left his position in the government. And then earlier on this year, he's just announced that he's gone off to, to Moderna to into, into some big clinical role in Moderna. So there's, how on earth is this happening? How can these people just be doing this in plain sight? Mm -hmm. It's because there's no, there's no, there's no scrutiny. There's no accountability. The newspapers don't care. Like, you know, cause they're all, they're all, they're all part of manufacturing the, the scam essentially. You know, oh, and that's, well, that's, but, yeah. The, the, they're, the they're all they're, they are and they're all they're all you know they're all bloody terrified actually at the moment yeah and 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 doing anything that they possibly can including starting wars and, and all sorts of things to draw attention away from the fact that they've basically been caught bang to rights and the demand now is for um you know justice as defined by basically the nuremberg code yeah i mean this is what we're looking at here the Nuremberg Code was written after the Second World War to make sure that the the, the experimentation and the, the atrocities carried out by the Nazis in the concentration camps could never happen again, right? And there were 10 principles to it. And the COVID vaccination program, that entire process, um, every single one of those principles was violated pretty much from the outset. I know. And and everyone's just sort of sitting there going, oh, well, no, this is all fine now. And, and, you, and you hear people saying, oh, well, you know, medical ethics develops over time. It's like, no, it doesn't. It shouldn't. <laughs> you know, if, if, you, if you've got people writing down rules to stop the things that the Nazis were doing, then we should listen to that. 
Yeah, the idea that, you know, over time that that becomes less relevant. So, no, no, no. The only people saying that it becomes less relevant over the time are the people who want to do those things again. Like we 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 got we you know we need a we need a a, a, a real truth and reconciliation process right that's the way I see it mm. and, and for some people there won't be any reconciliation because they would have done things that are completely inexcusable criminal and they need to face justice for and that's a lot of people in the top levels of establishment media certainly in the health system and, and a whole bunch of other places too certainly in the big consulting firms you know that's that's a place where we could be going to look for people to um to 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 seek justice from Mm -hmm. you know now let's switch so we've touched on uh like track and trace nhs cameron coming back onto the scene uh very timely (laughs) moment just out of nowhere and his connections to a company called illumina and blair now let's switch to blair and his um connection with uh, (laughs) rothschild family and uh foundation yeah it's on a journey tell you on a journey. yeah well so i mean tony blair's a he's a piece of work right so again like another War one criminal can we just say that right out from the yeah, yeah, very yeah, yeah. beginning here like anybody listening to this that guy should be behind bars for like crimes against humanity yeah at least, he should be he should he should be behind bars at least Right. And, you know, justice needs to be served on these people and, 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 and justice for, for the, the, the things that people like Blair have done that like, could go beyond just prison time. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I won't extra- extrapolate on that too much, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, because, um, you know, not only is he, is he a war criminal, he's, he's completely unapologetic war criminal. So actually, a chill court inquiry, he basically said, I'm not going to apologize. I do it all again. Right. So, you know, we invaded Iraq uh, under uh, um, based on false information. We killed nearly a million innocent people. But I'm not going to apologize for that. I do the same thing again if if I had if I was given the opportunity to do it today. So, oh, wow. OK, you were completely uh, psychotic. Um, <laughs> and, can we, and, can we <laughs> define false information as just outright lies used yeah. to gain public opinion, to go and invade and kill millions of people under the uh, under the light of they are harboring weapons of mass destruction therefore we must follow the u.s into this country and wipe out all, all under like the guise of you know collateral damage it needs to be done it's just so sick under the guise of 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 of, of, of uh, under a banner of peace right this is, this is the remarkable right. thing it's like we're gonna we're gonna invade to bring them democracy and freedom but, Classic so, Orwell stuff here. Yeah, no, it is, yeah. You know, and but if you look at um I mean Blair's an absolute piece of work, isn't it? He he he's um gosh, the amount of things that he's been doing since since he got into power in, in 97, right? So I mean so one of the first things that he did, that's what I always love this one, is he, he he reduced the penalty for treason from death to imprisonment. So why would you reduce the penalty for treason? Like Unless you were intending to commit treason, like, there's no reason to do that. It's, it's like an appalling act, right? To, to completely betray your countrymen. Like, that's just, it, it's, it's as low as you can possibly go. So what are you doing in the in the first term of your prime ministership, going around and, and making some changes to, to, to laws like that? It seems like a really odd thing to do. Uh, he also, and I talked a bit about, um, so I, do, I, I do a news um, segment on every Friday, on a website called UK Column, who are fantastic, and you should find out about UK Column if you don't know about them. And I spoke a bit on on Friday about about what Blair's been up to, and he also established an organisation called Nesta, which is the uh, National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts, and uh, he's, he's positioned as a, um, a UK innovation.
by Ben. We we dropped out just as you're outing Blair. Um, you know, for those <laughs> for those wearing tinfoil hats, you know, pay attention. So you were just saying he's he's uh, positioned as uh, UK innovation, and then you drop. So what's the title? Uh, the no, this is Nesta. So Nesta okay. is, is it's a Nesta is an organisation that's positioned as a, a UK innovation accelerator for um mm. for social good. <laughs> and uh, and they're going around they, they got given 250 million quid by um uh by the national lottery back in 97 and then that as an endowment they've been using to invest in things and they, they, they've got about 500 million uh under management right now um so they're, they're very well funded they're well backed they've, they've got a fantastic office down on victoria embankment right by blackfires bridge I went down there last week to an event that they were running and you listen to what they're doing and look at their project portfolio and, and read into the backgrounds of the people who run the organization. It's like, okay, you're basically engaged in a huge industrialized social engineering, social transformation program that is designed to fundamentally reshape British society towards your hyper left-wing hyper progressive political ends and um you're you're absolutely everywhere you know like you're um they're 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 they're, they're working on huge policy you know future of the uk in 2040 type questions for for central government um they're working with uh, a lot of private corporations in a whole range of different industry sectors uh, they're working with international governments. I mean, literally, like so, f from from um, uh, central London, they're, they're projecting these ideas and these ways of doing things to across Asia, across Latin America. They then work in the US. They work across Europe. Um, and that organization, Nestor, is a, is a legacy of the again the, the Blair first term. It was established in 1998. So there's a bunch of things that, that Blair did really early on that are actually still have been running that entire time. And uh, when you dig into them, it's like, oh, OK, this is actually a really important structural part of how you are progressing this global agenda that you're progressing. And you set it up knowing that this would be useful and this would be the case 25 years ago. You know, so this is stuff that's been laid down over a very long period of time um and it's kind of operating in the background because nest has got it's got no democratic remit to be doing what it's doing no one asked for that to, to be created no one's said we need uh certainly not in the mass population have said we need this organization to come along and, and to be fiddling around the edges of society in order to radically transform it in a way that's best suits the vision of of this tiny bunch of political elites and they actually describe themselves as political elites all sitting around in, in Westminster and Brussels and Washington DC. Uh, but that's, but that's what certainly what they're doing. And, and, and Blair's take now. So N Nesta is more of a UK focused agency, but it does have operations internationally. Whereas Blair, he's obviously got his um, Tony Blair Institute for global change. Uh, and he's been running that institute for a little while. The global change bit, I think, is a more recent addition to the name of it, right? But 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 that tells you everything that you need to know about what he's up to and the agendas that he's promoting, right? It's, it's all the same stuff as uh, we've been hearing from Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum for the past three, four years. You know, in particular, he's been much more visible and vocal, certainly through the the the, uh, the COVID situation he was. And it's, it's all the same thing. So it's all predicated it on um centralized digital control systems digital id cards having uh these huge data sets that um that government can uh run algorithms across and it, government and its partners in the private sector because generally speaking the government is really bad at building technology so they use other people like microsoft and amazon to do that for them but essentially the government owns the service owns the owns the population right that's really how they see it owns the data set and then they get other people to come in and help them build the tools that they need to to do the things that they want to do and that touches on absolutely everything right so we really talk quite a bit about healthcare and the idea that they want to introduce these um genetic engineering technologies into the health system from 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 birth right so they'll actually be um taking bloods 
even pre-birth, right? So they're actually talking about taking bloods from, from kids who haven't even been born yet. So they're in, in utero, right? They're, they're actually in, in the womb, taking blood from them so that you can genetically sequence them before they're even born so that you can then make projections about what, what long-term health issues they might potentially have and already put them onto a pharmaceutical pathway yeah, before they've even like taken their first breath. Malthusian yeah, so wet dream, mate. That, that, yeah, that's it, just freaking unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Like, who the hell do you think you are? Like, what on earth thinks that you have the right to do that? And 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 let's and they're sort of, you know they're playing God. Right? They really, mm. they, it really is that they think uh, that you know they, well they 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 worship another master. Let's yeah. put it like that. You, you can go there, uh, mate. You can go there. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> well, whether they, whether they realize it or not, you know, some of these people are actually yeah. outright Satanists. You know, let's just put it mm. out there. Like they they worship the devil, and they act accordingly. And and for a lot of British people in particular, where we've had religion removed from our lives quite mm -hmm. surgically over the past few decades, mm -hmm. you know, really since the, the end of the Second World War, the role of the church has just gone completely downhill in this country. And, 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 and a lot of that is unsurprising because the people who run the church are these same people that um like, the, like Tony Blair, like Justin Welby is, you know, he's, he's they're all on the same agenda as, as everyone else. So that, that institution was captured maybe several hundred years ago. Right. Um, you know, so the church has been has been dying out in this country for a very long time. So and, and, and we don't get, you know, given religion in any any sensible fashion, really, like certainly not in any of the institutional systems. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, British people are, are quite cynical about it. You know, they start doing the eye rolling and stuff. Basically, they think that you're, you're a bit of an idiot if you if, if you if you believe in God or, or, or Christian teachings or anything like that. Because yep. that's the way that it's, that it's been set up. Um, They'll respect but, your right to be called uh, are they them, but they're going to eye, eye roll you if uh, you say, yeah, I'm Christian or I'm Catholic or I'm Jewish or I'm, yeah. you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I understand, that, or, or or I or I get something from you know reading biblical passages and see how they are prophetic and how these things are manifesting in the world, and you know, and they'll 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 they'll, they'll laugh at you and think you're like sort of small minded and 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 anachronistic and. And, and 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 you know fine whatever like you 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 can if you want I, I used to be like that but I'm not anymore I can tell you that for free but um you know if you whether you believe in God or not these people do and they choose to worship the devil and they act accordingly yeah so the things that they're doing are deceptive manipulative destructive violent often um and a lot of them are running the show. They're, they're actually running the system you know and, and i think blair probably falls into that category to be honest with you and um the uh yeah he's 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 he's, he's a bad guy and and and, and um yes yeah, so, well yeah we, so we were talking yeah we were talking about uh the, the health system but it's also it's it's it, they're pushing all of this um technology everywhere right so like the you know you it's great that you're homeschooling by the way and i'd love to talk to you more about that uh maybe on a different interview maybe i could interview you about about homeschooling because i think that's that that's the future or certainly part of the future um uh because you know the, the 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 mainstream school system is is being totally ideologically subverted and the quality of the, the education is is going through the floor, and they're really dead set on introducing AI into the classroom. They've got no idea what the long term implications of that might be, um, but they're going to do it anyway. And um, that will involve them building a digital record of your kids. Uh, their their most fundamental thought patterns you know like literally as they develop cognitively and intellectually and spiritually as a child like this would all be recorded into a database that the state will have access to yep. right and then that will that will form a permanent record that they're able to understand you at a, at a, at a, at a um at the deepest possible level you know and and a lot of these you know people but again like people are quite blase about this stuff or they don't think it matters too much but it really does yeah like the the for the state particularly given how we've seen them behaving over the past few years for them to know 
really your 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 innermost thoughts yeah and how you react to information in the world and 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 to have that hold over you to have that power over you to have the understanding of how to manipulate you emotionally or or or, or psychologically you know and and to, and to have that available for their algorithms to access yeah while they're making their um institutional judgments about how how best to control you is it's it's extraordinarily dangerous and depressing and just really mind-blowing that it's even got to this point to be honest with you and that there are actually people back there who are happy to structure and build these systems but they're there you know and blair's it's... absolutely pr promoting this he's on the front line of it the education system is their biggest weapon, mate. It's their, it's their yeah. um, jewel in the crown. Uh, I mean, what's the, the saying? Give me a child until he's seven and I'll show you the man. And, you know, we as uh, yeah. we, 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 we give them, if we talk about starving the beast, we've got, to, we've got to stop feeding the beast our kids' hearts, souls, and minds, you know, from the age of three, four, or five. It's getting earlier <laughs> and earlier, and it's just absolute nonsense. And now, yeah, like, you, like you're saying, bringing AI into it and taking it, um, <laughs> yeah. Being able to track the thought process of any kid, like, you know, if a kid puts a hand up in, in classroom, that stays in classroom, right? But now, mm. yeah, no, let's get them all on one technological platform that we can harvest the data for. And if you want to socially engineer a country, this is the best tool by far that you could ever yeah. have dreamed up yeah yeah and, ai is yeah. and it was the 10th point in the uh, the communist manifesto just so everybody's aware of that uh karl marx's communist manifesto number 10 is uh uh free state education right. number five was a central bank by the way but uh and if you go through all 10 of them you'll probably realize oh shit he's just described described my country yeah yeah so yeah state education is you know again it's one of these things that it gets talked about oh isn't it fantastic we have state education it's like the the, the quality is appalling and it's just like the nhs it's like that you just go and go and go and look at the, the quality of the education it's it, 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 it it's not designed to make you independent prosperous hmm. intellectually curious you know like it, it, none of those things it's, it's, that's not what it's for it's made to design you easy to, to, it's made it's designed to make you easy to control um and the ai is a really insidious part of it and they talk about it as um i was this woman on this tony blair event uh, that i watched earlier on back in july i think it was and she says oh yeah we've got this tool and what it does is it can intervene in student misconceptions so okay <laughs> so basically so you if i if i'm a student and i've got my little ai buddy and i go is there a way to overthrow the state for yeah. example you know it's, an, it's a fairly crude thing but you get my point right then the the state sanctioned ai well first of all it will track that you've asked that question so that makes you dangerous and they now know that but then second of all it will correct you in your misconception that you could possibly ever overthrow or want to overthrow the state wouldn't it because that the state the state controls it so anyone caught thinking the wrong thing will be nudged and then increasingly aggressively slapped back into line by this tool that's controlled by um, the same people who are, you know, doing all the genetic engineering and crashing the financial system and starting all the wars. It's all mm -hmm. come from the same place. It's all coming from the same place. Which leads yeah. us to Rothschild and his connection yeah. to Blair. Or, the, yeah, excuse yeah. me, the Blair's connection to to that family yeah well, back still... to lauren's first question yeah so well so so we, so we um yeah the the and i'm by the way, i'm learning more about this is uh, uh, even just over the weekend like so so um i i knew i know i know i've known a lot about the the world economic forum the technological agenda where that's being driven from how it's manifesting at a nation state level mm -hmm. and right, then through Blair's... the young global leaders program right uh, you know yeah, we've young, even had yeah. schwab say we've penetrated their cabinets like he yeah. said that <laughs> you know? yeah 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 they're complete completely gone i mean the, the, the worst is canada i think something like 60 70 percent of trudeau's cabinet they're all world economic they're all young global leaders but blair was on the the, the young global leader program yep. well it, it was called the global leaders of tomorrow up until from 93 until which is the inaugural year until i think 2001 or 2002 
it was called the Young Global, uh, the, the Global Leaders of Tomorrow, GLT, and then it changed to the Young Global Leaders. But Blair was in, was in the first cohort. And before he became leader of the Labour Party, he was the first cohort to, to be part of that programme. And, um, and, and then you and you go through and look at uh, a whole just raft, like generational, um, uh, a, a whole generation or maybe even a couple of generations of, uh, just even just in this country, yeah, in the UK, of, of Labour, Tory, Lib Dem politicians, they're, they're, they're young global leader graduates. Mm-hmm. Oh, you just sewing the whole thing up. You've got senior people from the BBC in there. You've got, you know, and, and this this information has all been collated. The, the best place to go for that is the, the Malone Institute. Robert Malone, the yep. inventor of RNA technology. So he's um, he's got a website called maloneinstitute.org and then on their homepage there they basically collated all of the the, the young global leaders but even places, i think people like rio ferdinand the people like that are on there you know like it's 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 it's, it's absolutely everywhere um so i was very much like focused on that stuff and then um and then seeing how it was manifesting at a, a local level in the uk and then and then basically when blair did his uh his future of Future of Great Britain event in July. That's what it was. Um, when he announced it, he 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 basically is, was co-hosting this event with a with a, a, a labor young Labour politician called Mete Chaban, who's who's a, a a guy from Hackney, uh, who is the son of asylum seekers. So they're very very big on pushing that part of his story. Um, and he runs, so he's a, a, a Labour councillor in Hackney. He's responsible for um, sustainability. So all of the ULES stuff in Hackney, that's him. Um, and he's very obviously being groomed to be a, a national leader of the left. You know, potentially they even see him as a future prime minister. I don't know. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um and they, uh, um, uh, uh, he he he's also um, CEO of a charity called My Life My Say, which is all about like n- n- nominally is all about getting young people involved in politics, uh, which is a you know a noble thing to want to do. But then when you dig into it, it's like, oh, okay, this is this is the approach that you're taking. And this is the ideological spin that you're putting on everything, right? Because it all comes from this hard left wing, critical theory type analysis of Western civilization. Yeah, which is a really manipulative and crude way of looking at our society that basically says that, um, you know, that the, the we are uh, a... a, a um, uh, patriarchal and racist and um, intolerant and uh, essentially need to be the 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 the, the traditional structures of the West um, and this country in particular need to be completely um, rebuilt and reordered and 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 that needs to be done in in a in a in a, uh, in, a um, in in a way that is like really totally detached from what went before like they they sort of view our our heritage and our history as 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 this kind of evil that needs to be expunged from the world like it's really nasty actually like when you when you get into it um and uh this organization my life my say was set up quite a while ago now it's around 2014 2015 so he's been doing this for a good few years um but uh it really kicked into gear in 2021 and uh they did a big piece of work to um build uh to to get young people signed up for um local local elections i can't remember which local elections it was but they basically did a big piece of activity they signed up 100,000 kids who hadn't been signed up to vote to sign up to vote so it was high impact a lot of awareness online um and then basically he got an mbe so he got a he got a gong for that um so that was prince charles as he was at the time gave him his mbe and then um and then at the same time as he got the mbe they they basically leveled up what they were doing with my life my say and he got a whole load more institutional people involved with it 
including a bunch of people onto their board of trustees. And one of the guys, I was doing a load of research into this because I was looking at the Tony Blair Institute, like what's Tony Blair up to and who's that guy that he stood next to? So I was like, okay, I'm going to go and look at who, who he stood next to. Did a bunch of research into, into Coban and My Life, My Say. And then I was digging around on their website and their trustees, they got quite, you know, got six or seven trustees. But it doesn't actually, just, on the website, it doesn't actually say who they are. It just has their name. So it's like, okay, well, this is a bit weird because I'm a trustee of a charity. And we always have like a biog and links to your social media profiles. And like they want to talk about who you are because it's like part of the charity. You know, the reason you're on the board is because it gives them, you know, it's an asset to the charity, basically. Mm-hmm. and they want people and to people want to fun. know you know who they're sending money to and who's like yeah. the trusted people behind and steering and like you know yeah, yeah. so pretty yeah, exactly. basic right you should have a <laughs> bio a... yeah you should have a bio yeah just basic stuff i mean literally like no website ever i can't even think of a website that i've been on it's just got particularly for an organization like that it's just got a name and and the photo and nothing no other information so i was i went through i was like oh, i need to find out who these people are and um, the ones, the, the, I think the first one I looked at was this guy called Glenn Manning. And Glenn Manning, it turns out, was a, a, a long-time banker at J.P. Morgan, which is a Rothschild-affiliated organization. He was then actually a portfolio manager at, at Rothschild's, N.M. Rothschild. I forget the exact entity. I think it's N.M. Rothschild, based out of Paris. So he's actually a portfolio manager there. And then in 2021, at the same time that Metti Coban got his MBE and at the same time that Glenn Manning joined the board of trustees, he also then stepped up into a new position as an advisor to something called R&Co for Generations, which is a philanthropic fund personally overseen by Alexandra de Rothschild from NM Rothschild in Paris, which has explicitly been set up to accelerate the delivery of six of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, the, the SDGs, the Global Goals. So, and, and they're hiding that information. So, so Blair is, is, is a strategic partner to this guy and this organisation and is presenting him as like a, a, a sort of mini me type individual who's going to come in at some point, probably, and, you know, unite the country around his grand vision for the future. You can see how they're teeing this all up with Chaban in particular. Um, but that guy is, is basically a puppet for, for the Rothschild family. And like anyone with an internet connection and, you know, 10 minutes can go out and put those dots together if they choose to do so. No one had done it as far as I'm aware up to that point, but I did it. And then I, I I wrote an article about it and I, I spoke to James Dellingpole about it and here we are, right? And that's just one connection, you know, because um, that's one strand of the family, the, the Rothschild strand of the family, but then you've got the core cool Rothschild strand of the family, which is actually Jacob Rothschild, fourth Baron Rothschild, you know, the guy that actually sits in the House of Lords, you know? So these people who we get, the, they deny the existence of and it's a conspiracy theory to talk about, they are ennobled and they sit in our houses of, of, of parliament. They exist. They're there. You can go and look at them. They've got websites, like they've got personal profiles. They do charitable events and philanthropic stuff all the time. Of the course. idea that they, philanthropy, they, they are always hiding behind philanthropy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really, really manipulative. Yeah. Because it's all designed to 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 to, to progress their agenda ultimately, which is towards single global slave state is what they want so this is this is a single global digital slave state where we are subjugated by global governance technology enabled global governance who know absolutely everything about you where you are what you're thinking uh what you're searching for on the internet who you're talking to and associating with uh what you're buying um what your what we you know your health your your, your health status your, your 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 um which which pharmaceuticals you've um you are up to date with based on government um sanctions about about having to take certain chemicals as as you know they were trying to push out a couple of years ago um you know they 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 
the agenda is very clear and um not only are they these people circulating around in the background they are actually actively involved on the boards of the organizations that are out in public talking about the stuff and, and pushing this whole thing forward and the my life my say one is particularly manipulative i think because it's focused on, on younger people you know because they're, they're basically very very specifically going after um younger people particularly from um recent immigrant populations yeah so you know to, to use the awful term that i absolutely detest that gets used all the time by the left and by people in the mainstream these are people of color as they would describe it <laughs> yeah uh which which is really really racist but hey you know it's all right when they do it it's not all right when anyone else does it apparently um and they're particularly focused on young women as well. So there's this whole sort of um, they're going hard on the race, racial division, and then hard on the gender division. And uh, they're sort of manufacturing, uh, and they're really well backed. They're really well politically connected, um, and they are they're trying to. Uh, the way I see it is basically just to, to to artificially overwhelm. The, de the democratic process as a way of capturing the state they want to capture the country that's, that's what this stuff is, is, is driving towards and they want to transform it into their progressive neo-marxist utopia right? that's the way that these people think and a lot of them um they really bought into that in a in a not um in a non sort of cynical way you know, there's a lot of people involved in these movements particularly the younger people going to these events They'll just be there because they want to make the world a better place. They can see that it's it's it, it, it's a screwed up world that we live in, and they think that this this potential path offers a solution to to, to make things better. But what they don't realise is that the people that have screwed the world up that they live in today are the ones behind this movement that they're trying to get them to join to to create a better world. They've got absolutely no interest in making things better at all. You know, they they're just um, shepherding a generation of young people into oblivion basically you know mm. total subject total subjugation and getting them to to thank them for the for the opportunity to do so while they're doing it i mean it's, it's totally unhinged um and, and, and it's like just this, this psyop you know in america they have the same psyop like your vote matters right it's always three words isn't it these these like uh catchy little slogans and yeah um, going out and and just psyoping people into uh, believing in the democratic process. Whereas you and I know there is none. It, there is no left or right. And actually, there's a passage in this book that um, I've just uh, been gifted towards world government, new world order, which was written by Deirdre Manifold. And, um, you know, just a very short paragraph about the left and right. Um, yeah, politics is a game in the pursuit of power. In all democracies, there are two separate organizations playing the game. There is a visible one, whose players hold office as members of a government and an invisible one composed of individuals who control the visible and in whom is vested the real power, that of money, which makes or unmakes its tools. So those, you know, at yeah. the charge, in charge of the money, the central banks who are pushing these agendas down through the policymakers and capturing these politicians by whatever methods possible, whether that is just straight up bribery or uh, capturing them in um, some kind of scandal that they can blackmail them with. And those policies getting pushed down through the different regulatory bodies and then down through the different uh, ministries, certainly into the health system, as we've already discussed, certainly into the education system, as we've already discussed. Your vote does not fucking matter, people. Like, it just doesn't. There is no left or right. They're all part of the same team. And yeah. it would just be a different puppet in charge at a different time. Yeah, I mean, particularly, you know, I can talk much more to this country because of, you know, because I'm I'm from the I'm from England, and uh, we can see this stuff playing out in front of us on a daily basis. But I, I have conversations, you know, with friends of mine who are sort of looking at, and I've been talking to them about what's going on for a little while now, and I think they're slowly coming to the realization that I might be, might not be as mad as they thought I was. But a lot of them are still going, oh, well, you know, we've got a general election next year and Starmer doesn't look too bad and maybe it'll be a better thing. It's like, no, 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 no. Starmer is controlled by Blair. 
Hmm. So the, at the at the at the Blair um the 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 Global Institute event in July that Blair ran that I I watched um and I've done a few posts and a bunch of interviews about separately to this one. Um, Starmer turned up at the end of the day for half an hour sit down with Tony Blair and basically gave his his approval to everything that had been said. So if if you vote for Starmer, then what you're going to get is Blair. And if you if you, what you're getting is Blair, then you've got a war criminal running the country again, remarkably, who's promoting an, a, a global a, a, a global agenda. I mean, he's called his organisation the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it, it, it does what it says on the tin. You know, so everything he's promoting is designed to push us and humanity more broadly towards this single digital slave state. And he sat there immediately behind Keir Starmer whenever he says anything out in public. Like this is all being coordinated from his handlers, you know, a level above Starmer. You know, the people think it's the same in the US as well, by the way. People think although the American president does have a lot of power. In reality, they're only um, like middle management in, in the corporation. Yep. You know, they're the people out there... Um, uh, they their their role is to deliver the populace, yeah, but they don't get to change direction of travel particularly, you know. Like the, a lot of this stuff has been laid down for, yeah, a lot of it's been laid down for centuries, you know. No, with with not... each term in any country, the, the the ultimate goal of the term of that president, prime minister, whatever, is to uh, increase the size of the government and. Yeah increase the amount of taxes ever so slightly every four years yeah however long it is just keep it going unfortunately for us these these people have yeah they, they've been around for centuries if not thousands of years just implementing these this slow trickle um but what's woke people like you and me up was 2020 covid like no 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 there's a line in the sand that needs to be drawn here and we've got to like really think about what we're being told but uh. yeah you got to you got to think about what we've been told look look at the fundamental technologies and well not even just technology look at the fundamental like ideological theological philosophical underpinnings of what our society and our civilization are about and then look at what uh, the, the the fundamental technologies are that we use to run and operate that civilization. One of the one of the fundamental technologies that we use is money. It's a, it's a you know really important part of how the system works currently. Um, uh, you know, and that's obviously the, you know you talk a lot about Bitcoin, so you you've looked into that side of things, and you know I, I've done quite a bit in that space myself over the years. Um, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, but I do think that we need alternative currencies um and actually they're already there and that's the thing about a lot of this stuff it's one of the reasons why i'm quite optimistic you know we've got all these ghoulish people in positions of power and they're leading the narrative and they've got all of the corporations on board and they run the central banks and all this kind of stuff and it's quite overwhelming but actually they're very replaceable particularly because of we now have the internet right you know, Bitcoin's a great example of a digital asset. Um, the ones I think that I'm particularly interested in are uh, asset-backed digital currencies, which you're probably familiar with, like ABDCs. Um, um, but but you know, there are lo- loads of different ways of, of of storing and transporting value around the system so that people can transact with each other uh, that don't involve the Bank of England or the Bank of International Settlements or you know, anything like that at all. And mm-hmm. and actually what, what the most important thing is that you have enough people in your in your in your marketplace, in your network who are willing to cooperate based on your um agreed underlying asset class that you're going to trade with. Yeah. That um that you can run a, a a fully integrated system that's that's got enough within it to to to, to sustain life for for the long term. Um, Again, the the all of the information is out there for people to go and <laughs> you know, read up on, like uh, just go and read the secrets of the Federal Reserve or the the creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, I've got a book here, um, which was 
recommended to me called Red Symphony. I don't know if you've ever come across this one. No. Uh, this, um, mate, it's just a chapter from a huge book, but it's a chapter, it's a transcript of a conversation um, that was held in 1938 between uh, a guy called Rakovsky, who was the, the Russian ambassador to France, um, who was up for basically execution the next morning by, uh, by Stalin. And to, to try and save his life, he just spilt the beans on who are they and, and whatever else and how they captured the money. And, um, you know, it, it's incredible, like some of these, some of these sentences and he, he's explaining to the interrogator that, you know, you, you have to come, if you come at this from the basic axiom of money is power and how that power was wrestled away uh, from the people uh, who, you know, were organizing themselves around a gold standard, essentially, uh, to this phony money that we have today that can be printed out of counterfeited out of nowhere. And that counterfeited money um, be leveraged into the system on which you borrow and pay interest on. I mean, this is usury in its like most criminal form. Now, any bank loan is basically fraud. If a, if somebody if a bank loans you money to buy a house, a car, whatever, that money doesn't come from somewhere. They they counterfeit it into the system legally ordained by the central bank that gives them the banking license but then they can't they charge you an interest on that that is pure fraud that mm -hmm. is pure fraud known for thousands of years it's written about in all religious texts uh and um this is the world in which we live in mate this is the clown world in which we live today yeah right i mean I, you know i can't quite see the city of london from my window here but like it's just over there and that's the global center of what you've just described, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it's the square um, mile as well, right? Which is its own exactly. kind of little city state. I, I don't think it, a lot of people understand that. Do you want to riff on yeah. that for a little bit? Like it's, it's a country yeah, yeah. within a country, basically. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a separate, it's a separate state. Exactly. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, not subject to the same laws as the rest of the UK. In, in, in a way I see it, we've kind of, have been colonized by the city actually that's the way i think about it these days that england has been colonized by the city of london that kind of sits there and if you know anything about london if you've been here in the past 20 years you'll know that all of the all of the growth has happened inside the square mile all of the buildings going up like these huge skyscrapers going up all over the place it's all happened in the city the rest of the city around it a lot of it's like becoming you know increasingly poor and dilapidated and you know it's 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 not experienced the same level of investment and hasn't reaped the benefits of whatever the hell's been going on to to drive that that kind of global growth but yeah it's it's it's, it's separate from, from from the rest of the country in the same way that the vatican does so the vatican city is its own it's the world's smallest country supposedly and the same thing with Washington DC as well. It's a separate, separate to the United States. It's basically a kind of distinct corporate entity. It's got its own governance, its own rules. Um, you know, very famously with the city of London, the the, the monarch. So Charles, for example, as is, is, is he's currently, he isn't allowed to go there without the permission of 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 of, of the people who run the city of London. Right? Like they they actually have to. You know, there's there's a, an element of. Um, uh, sort of restriction placed even on the sitting monarch of the day their ability to go there and to to exercise any kind of power or authority inside the city of london because you know in reality all of the power um it, it, it lies with the banks um and uh i think that yeah we gotta that's just a one another one of the things that we got to deal with the the, corp, the the corporations as a as a whole i think like just that 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 actual legal construct of a corporation that sort of separate entity that is um distinct from uh the rest of humanity right it's it's, it's kind of treated as a, as a distinct thing i think that that's actually one of the fundamental problems that we've got and and the corporations basically run most of what we have in in, in this country you've got the city, city of london corporation which kind of sits right at the core of the city of london yeah so that that's a distinct separate operating unit that is owned by you know separate and away from the citizens the same thing with the, with the bbc like why is our national i never never really understood this why is our national broadcaster a corporation the british broadcasting corporation 
why is that bit tagged on the end? You know what I mean? It's a bit strange, isn't it? You don't really think about it. But mm. there's no reason for that to be the case. So why is it the case? And you know that there's something going on back there. And it'll be down to what they are allowed within their system to do to others, to people, based on these legal fictions that they create. Yeah. Huh. So what's what's the call to action here, mate? What, you know, <laughs> it, it, we can lead ourselves into a pretty dark corner pretty quickly, right? When you just start leafing back a bit of the onion. Um, yes, there's a lot of dark do. stuff in there that, that you yeah. face. Yeah, there's a lot of dark stuff going on. Yeah, I think the, the main thing... So uh, there's two things that I do. Well, there's a few, there's a few things I do. Like they, um, I write about systemic corruption uh, at my own blog, which is called riseuk.substack.com. I'm sure we'll provide a link for it somewhere. Um, and I also do a regular show on uh, UK Column News on a Friday and I work with UK column, ukcolumn.org, who are really good investigative journalists, uh, sort of independent media platform. And we're doing a lot right now to talk about the a bunch of the things that we've been talking about today. Yeah. Like so what what Blair's up to, what the globalists are up to, what their plan is, you know, all the sort of dark stuff. But then um conscious of the fact that the best way to to fix anything is to um you know constantly fighting them and their system isn't the fastest way to to get rid of them you've got to build a new system that will run in parallel to the one that they're promoting that will be fundamentally better for humanity and that's actually that's and and that's that's happening now people are doing it uh the um a lot of the 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 sort of Web three community, I think, were uh, really ahead of the curve in their thinking on this stuff. They could see what was going on in the banking system. They view cryptocurrencies as a way to um, uh, circumvent the power of the central banks. I think that that's absolutely correct. I do think that there's a lot of scammers in in crypto generally and a lot of the stuff that was built in web 3 was completely pointless and um in hindsight is is kind of laughable some particularly like the whole nft thing uh, it's just nuts um but but i think that it was a lot of it was kind of was was well intentioned and and actually needs to be directed um towards real world act activity and real real world manifestations so a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's happened with web3 it was it was purely digital it's purely online so people coming on say oh it's we're going to decentralize we're going to do this we're going to do that it's like okay well that makes sense so you've got the first bit right you're going to decentralize but then the way that you're trying to decentralize is is through is just just through the currency um and and um and then and then a lot of the the the, the exchanges and the kind of um the infrastructure that, su that supports this new world that you're building for yourselves a lot of that is running on like a aws tech for example like a aws cloud computing servers so like you haven't you haven't actually really decentralized you just created something different and stuck it on top of a centralized another centralized system but also, it, it, they, 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 a lot of it really missed out on just the basic core fundamentals, the underlying, the, like the really simple things that need to be in place in order for your civilization to operate. You know, it's all nice and well having these whizzy digital services and these 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 digital products on our on our you know on our mobile phones and and um, you know like that that that's all fine. But it, but none of that matters if you haven't got a functioning food supply. Mm. Uh, if you haven't got if you haven't got like cheap high quality food that's readily available for the population then you haven't got anything at all right you're going to starve to death and and to me the a lot of the um a lot of the web3 uh time and attention and a lot of really what you hear about like in you know people want to people want to do 
people want to generally they want to have a positive impact on the world like the vast majority of people want to have a positive impact so but when they talk about how they're going to have a positive impact a lot of it is about technology first so they want to do it with technology well actually i think a lot of the technology is is, is part of the problem um you know this sort of device first mentality with everything i think is actually perpetuating a lot of the issues we've got like you see it in um like in the health system so we're going we've got a mental health crisis so we're going to create an app to help fix the mental health crisis well actually people being on their phones constantly is probably one of the major drivers of there being a mental health crisis mm -hmm. what people need is one is one-to-one -one human connection yeah we need community and we need uh time away from technology to just sit in existing reality like base level reality as humans and and converse and interact with each other and and, and have fellowship and, and and all that kind of good stuff and that's the way that you fix the mental health problem not by loading more technology into the discussion and you see that all over the place yeah which you know, you know like, with that, um, with the lockdowns classic classic plan right get everybody yeah, locked down get them exposed purely to technology which we control the the lion's share of get them watching television which we yep. basically completely control and yep. keep them away from chatting with each other you know god forbid a couple of blokes should meet down the pub and talk about politics uh you know during this particular you know time we, we can't have that we can't have the yeah, proletariat yeah. meeting up and uh and discussing you know the the day's headlines certainly not you don't want that no that'd be a very dangerous thing to happen um so the uh yeah so that that's that that's uh, yeah, and they, and they want everything mediated through the glass, right? That's you know, and and, yep. and 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 that is that's that's absolutely clear. And you're right, it's because they control those platforms, and they can they can monitor, they can listen, they can um, and uh, you know, increasingly they can intervene in those discussions. And we see all the censorship that's been going on on all of the the, the social platforms has been going on on YouTube, Twitter, it's been going on Instagram all of them you know they're they're deliberately manipulating the the global public discussion in a way that is more amenable to them and the ends that they're working towards and all of those organizations are world economic forum partners so you know what they're up to right they're they're it's just it's all it's all the usual suspects so the game ultimately is uh, it's not necessarily to fight them head on because they're they're quite powerful and they've got a lot of influence and a lot of money and a lot of technology and all that kind of thing but to, to as far as possible is to just completely disengage from their system and just go over go over there and rebuild a system uh that has all of the good stuff that the the current system has and there are some things that are good about about the current system and these technologies are they're, they're pretty powerful and they're quite useful um you know so you don't necessarily want to throw them out completely but there's got to be a better way for us to build um our society that doesn't make us uh so beholden to big tech big banking big pharma big media whatever it might be all of these kind of global corporations and um mm -hmm. and, and, just, and, and it was pointed out to me government. the other day from uh from a friend when we were just having lunch about uh about netflix yeah and uh the CEO, um, or the, the co-founder, Mark Bernays Randolph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grandson of Ed Bernays. Like, yeah. the, I'm like, what? No way. Yeah. The inventor for those of... that don't know who Ed Bernays is, um, like, basically <laughs> uh, uh, a, a pioneer in the field of public relations and propaganda um, in, yeah. and, and in the US. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so Bernays was... I found that out recently as well. Yeah, the, so the and, yeah, right, and, and, and Obama is on the board of Netflix as well. You know, so the, yeah, that, <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but like, the, so the, yeah, so it's just, so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, a mass um, global uh, uh, psyop um, platform. Basically, that's what Netflix is, and yeah, it's, it's rooted in Bernays's work. And Bernays, as I understand it, he's actually um related to the freud family mm -hmm. and freud's communications which is a big pr company here in london they've actually been handling a lot of the global 
communications for the the uh, um, the UN global goals, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and um, a whole bunch of the organisations that are promoting that agenda. Right. So there's all there's so many links. PR is a really interesting area to look at. Um, and yeah, as you say, like Bernays, you know, they talk about it as oh, it's PR and it's press and profile, but it's like no, no, no. This was it, it was basically it was propaganda. That's why he thought about it at the time when he invented this yeah. category of, 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 of um, like basically social sciences. Um, and uh, yeah, social and, engineering. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Social, social engineering. Yeah. They want to, they want to complete. Yeah. They want to steal the country. They want to steal your kids, indoctrinate them, lie to them, um, you know, make them, Make them weak, make them sick, make them dependent on the state, mm. and uh, break down the family, the parental unit. Divorce absolutely. rates are through the roof. There's a reason for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's lots of reasons for that. Yeah, and 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 the, the 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 war on the nuclear family is is absolutely at the core of this. Like the you know uh, 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 fundamentally we are we are individuals, but then the next best kind of level up from that is 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 a solid nuclear family two parents um and you know that and and families then extrapolate out you know solid families extrapolate out into solid communities and solid communities extrapolate out into solid cities and regions and nations ultimately you know like everything is built on that foundation you know we've got to be as robust um independent reliable uh, healthy, uh, intellectually curious, um, uh, well, uh, uh, honourable, loyal, virtuous individual human beings, um, and and then the, and then the family is the is the next you know step on from that basically, and they and they're totally going after that. Yeah, they they're totally going after that. Um, have and, been and ever, they're quite and yeah, they're quite been, quite. quite Sorry, so, I, I was I was just going to read again from from this book, um, because chapter four is war on children, and they've been doing this. We, we've already mentioned this, Mark's character today, uh, and for um, yeah, I'll, I'll just read it out for you. So the directives of the Illuminati, who richly rewarded Karl Marx to wage their war in words, were that the child must be taken away from its mother, put into a state child care center and the mother sent off to work to force um excuse me uh yeah so then you would this has emanated in um in employment agencies such as the equality agency calling on the government to encourage mothers to return to the work workforce and to abandon their children who so badly need a mother's love when they return from school to sit in an empty home any home is empty without a mother in brackets there with the TV on for comfort, <laughs> I mean, this is this is like you're an. We probably grew up in this kind of um, <clears throat> atmosphere uh, because this started in earnest with uh, the feminist movement, right? Uh, yeah. And then um, John John Dewey, who was pushing this in the in the uh, in the US, he wrote, uh, "I believe, therefore, that the true center of correlation on the school subjects is not science, nor literature, nor history, nor geography." but the child's social activities. So that's the reason they want them there in the classroom. So they can track them and coerce them and manipulate them into a certain set of behaviors whilst the mother gets pushed back into the workforce and is not at home for the child. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and um, that's, you know, I've, I've been in the workforce for 20, 20 years now. Um, and I've always enjoyed working with women, but there's, it's become really, really combative actually. So there's this whole, like this, 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 this mentality that men are like some kind of uh, enemy that needs to be defeated by these women now entering the workforce. And it's all going to be female leadership and, you know they, uh, that's a big theme that you hear when you listen to these um these globalist uh, types talking it's all about well we need female leaders because the female yeah. leaders will will make the world nicer and fairer it's like okay 
well, where are we heading to with all these female leaders? And we're, we're, we're heading into global tyranny. So maybe there's an issue here and that needs to be thought about and dug into. Um, but also this 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 idea that um, having kids and raising a family is, 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 is it's like not a admirable or, or desirable thing to do. I, I don't, I don't no, know. Because you're not giving from, back to society, Ben, are you? Like, you know, you... You you have to be out there giving back to society some way. You can't just well, be at home, uh, well, homemaking. Well, I don't know if it's giving back to society. Even I think it's like you you need to for your own sort of personal um, uh, va- validation. Mm. You need to be pursuing some highfalutin, high powered corporate career in order to be a valid and important person in the world. So, well, that's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. Your, your, job, your job title doesn't mean anything, really. And, and, and also, like the, the most important job that anyone in society does is raising kids because they're the future of our civilization. So you actually already have the most important job, but you want to abandon that to go and be- become a i don't know like a, a, a like a, a you know like a a bean counter in 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 in, in, in a in, in in a company somewhere and you know like get paid a bit of money to do it and that's that's more important to you than raising y- y- your children i just i think it's incredibly depressing to be honest with you inverted like, um, world again yeah it's, it's, it's yeah everything is inverted yeah Absolutely. But to get back to like actionable points, yeah, we we I I, I agree with you. Um, yeah, look we at parallel talk. structures. Look at Bitcoin as a parallel structure to the financial system. Look at homeopathy as a a, a parallel structure to allopathy. Like the 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 health system that we have today is basically, as you've covered, it's there to keep us just sick enough. You know, it's not there to actually address the problem that is underlying in you and uh, when you read about uh the the formation of the um the american medical association and how they absolutely completely totally cancelled homeopathy or naturopathy in the u.s back in the uh, the 20s and 30s you know this is where this term quack comes from right pick up this yeah. book mate if you want to go deep and dirty on that murder by injection by eustace mullins Holy okay. goodness. Uh, it's all in there. And the formation of the uh, the American Medical Association, which was uh, brought around by um, the Rockefellers, who are a direct arm of uh, the Rothschilds, uh, operating for them as agents in the um, in the US. And again, you'd get eye rolled at for, uh, for bringing that kind of um, conspiracy theory to the table. But you only have to read a few books and it's like, all oh, right, yeah, there it is. And the... Um, the formation of the the Federal Reserve back in 1910, where those six or seven guys met on Jekyll Island, and with the U.S. Treasury, um, Nelson Aldrich, his daughter was married to one of the Rothschilds or Rockefellers. I'll have to double check that. You're like, oh my goodness! Like, you, it's only you only have to do the most basic of research. That is even on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, as I've now renamed it, but it's yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're, yeah, right. So I mean, it, yeah, yeah Wikipedia is an interesting one. Like the the um, Jimmy Wales, he's actually on the board of Nesta, that ch- the organisation I spoke really? about earlier. Yeah, yeah, he's on the board of that. Um, so Wikipedia, the guy that founded it, is also part of the, the that organisation that Tony Blair set up. Um, but then something else I found out on on uh, on. Uh, uh, wikipedia the other day is there's this organization which is a um because uh, are you familiar with the balfour declaration like the creation of israel oh, so basically no, it, there I was haven't gone it, it, it um there's an agreement between a u.s and a, a, a british um politician called balfour i can't remember his his name no. uh, his first name um the, uh, and um, representatives of uh, 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 the Rothschild family to create to create the state of Israel. So they actually, they actually um, agreed to do that in um, I think it was nineteen twenty around then. I think was Churchill involved in that as well? I think Churchill was involved in it in some ways as well. Yeah, 
And then basically, I found out the other day that there's this organization called um, Yad Hanadiv. I'm not going to be able to find it now. Now, there it is. Yad Hanadiv, which is, uh, so the Rothschilds were involved in the formulation of, of Israel, right? So that was an agreement made between the Rothschild family and and, uh, and, the, and the British state to establish Israel in the first place. And then there is a there is a, a Rothschild Foundation called Yad Hanadiv, which is a philanthropic foundation in Israel, and that was set up um, uh, to, to 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 promote Israeli interests. And, and and actually they funded the creation of the Knesset, which is the 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 um, Israeli Parliament. And then they also funded the creation of the Israeli Supreme Court. Now, and the Israeli Supreme Court, if if you believe, if you ever looked at photos of it, um, it's it supposedly has, and it certainly looks like it, the the all seeing eye pyramid built into the structure of the building, um, which is the same all seeing eye that you have on the back of the dollar bill, for example. Mm-hmm. So there's there is a there is a part of the bill if you can get I've got an image up in front of me here of the of the Israeli Supreme Court and there's a there there is basically a pyramid sticking out of the top of the Supreme Court that looks like the all seeing eye that was built using money from the Rothschild family mm-hmm. and all of that is obviously linked into what's going on on the ground today mm-hmm. in Israel and Gaza. You know, because as they say, all, all wars are bankers' wars, and um, Israel has got Rothschild fingerprints all over it. Yeah, you know, and these and these are the people called. And, and actually, if you if you listen to Netanyahu, so he he did a speech at the UN about um, uh, I don't know eight weeks ago, ten weeks ago, I think it was in September at some point. And he's basically did 20 minutes at the UN talking about the future of Israel and all that kind of thing. And 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 a, a bunch of what he's talking about is it's all exactly the same stuff as as what Blair's talking about, as what Klaus Schwab's talking about. It's all the same agenda. Yeah, it's all digital IDs, artificial intelligence, gene- genetic engineering. Uh, it's the same roadmap. They're all talking humanity into in the same direction. Um, and the people putting the strings behind the scenes, you know, like the like, like I said earlier, the, the the politicians, however lofty and important they 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 present themselves as being, or we view them as the prime ministers and the presidents of this world. Ultimately, they're just the public relations people. They're the communications officers out there selling the dream to the to the masses. But you know, they're not the ones actually setting the agenda. That's all being done out the back. Um, uh, under the auspices of people like the, the Rothschild family, yeah. So I've just found who, who, out. I've just found out what? about how Churchill was in, involved in this. Uh, in the peace that followed World War One, the new League of Nations provided legal status called mandates for territories transferred from the control of one country to another. Though a mandate was supposed to be a waypoint toward independence, cynics called it a polite term for colony building. <laughs> Britain was given the mandate of Palestine, including what is now Jordan and Israel. Its capital was Jerusalem. As colonial secretary in 1921, Churchill established Georgian, Jordan in six-sevenths of the mandate and backed a Jewish homeland in the remainder, where the Zionists had largely settled. One principle of the Balfour Declaration, he told Jewish, a Jewish delegation, is that the process of the establishment of a national home for Jews is to be without prejudice or unfairness to the Arab and Christian inhabitants. Then many in Parliament objected. In 1922, they tried to cancel the Balfour Declaration with warnings that sound remarkably familiar. But of course, it goes ahead. And we have what we have today going on there. And uh, man, yeah. this is... It's all such chilling stuff, mate. It's... um. Isn't it just? Well, this is the thing. This is what we need to disengage from. Uh, you got to keep your eye on it. But I think the... Um, have you... Uh, like a personal question. You don't have to answer it. Do, do you fear that by uncovering this stuff, that you're putting a target on your back, that these people are watching you 
and I, I mean, we're two like plebs sitting, like having a discussion. This is all kind of new information to me in the last year or so, but yeah. you know, with their reaches, with their tentacles, with their silencing skills, with the, the activities that we know that they're engaged in and the people that they've silenced in the past, uh, what, what goes through your thoughts there? No, I'm not scared of them. They can't do anything to me. I mean, I'm, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian believer. So I believe that we go to heaven, uh, when we die. And so everything that I do in this life will, um, put me in good stead for the next. So I, I, I have no, um, I have no fear of, of, of man, um, and, and what they might be able to do to me. Um, but I also think that they're kind of on their last legs, actually. I mean, it's becoming increasingly desperate. Uh, and they don't have the the big problem they've got is they haven't got very good people. You know, like if if you if you're it's, it's a it's a big old personnel issue, right? Like if 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 you if your organization, if your crime syndicate, which is what they've got, is in order to thrive in that organization, you have to be corruptible and dishonest and um you know uh, easily compromised then that doesn't make for a good team do you know what i mean because you've just got a bunch of people who are dishonest and corruptible and easily compromised so well you know when when the shit hits the fan that's going to collapse and that's basically what we're looking at now people who um who uh, are corporate bureaucracy players trying to deal with um and and the tip of the management, right? The, the the very highest order of of this criminal organization, uh, hundreds of years of inbreeding. Yes, exactly that as well. Yes, and we know right. what that does. <laughs> yeah, it's like there's. I think that they, you know, they say, um, you know, remember Wizard of Oz, like when 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 the curtain comes back and people will actually see what the wizard is. It's just some little man putting some levers behind the curtain and like all of the noise and bluster and the the, the light show and the the great terror that supposedly the the the, the grand wizard is revealed to just be a, a like a like a, a set of tricks really. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. You know, I think that when when the to the curtains pull back on on what's actually going on here, you you realise that these people are they're, they're not they're not actually particularly intimidating at all. They're just you know, and in some ways, although I'm not for any, not 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 in any way um, trying to excuse what they've done or what they are doing. Like in in some ways, a lot of them they they're kind of victims of this as well because they've been born into these families, they've been born into these uh, these situations that have been set up uh, a long time before they were they, they were even alive, and they just kind of been sucked into it a bit. Um, I often wonder, you know, these these descendants, the the, the Rothschilds that are that are around today how much they know of like the family history or they've just been completely indoctrinated and brainwashed since birth to believe mm. in certain things in Malthusian order. And, you know, it, it's the, it's their cross to bear that they, they must oversee like the, the, the population of the, the world and steer the useless eaters and, and all of this kind of stuff, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they probably, they probably, they probably. Um, I'd imagine they're pretty good stewards of their own history. Like, I think that the 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 mm -hmm. um, you know, families like that, they're pretty egotistical, and you know, they like they like to talk about themselves. So, uh, they they probably they 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 probably know they probably know most of what's going on. Um, but they, yeah, the the main thing is, and like I guess to to, to come back to your question mm. about what to do next is is Let's do, we've got to disengage from this reality that they've constructed. It's not it's this fake reality that they've constructed. Get back to basics. Um, sort out our food supply. Sort out the education system. Become much more independent of global corporations and certainly of the state yeah like the idea that we're going to be going to the state for everything which Blair would love and is the dominant narrative that we're being pushed in the media that oh, the state's got to get more involved in this, the state's got to get more involved in that. It's like, no, the state should be like reduced to an absolute bare bones minimum, you know? Um, and we certainly should, I'm, 
you know, like the like shouldn't be supporting it in any way, either financially or or really through our, our engagement in whatever charade of a, an election process that they say that they're going to put us through. And um, you know, we've got to get back into our into ourselves, into our families, into our communities, and into um, into our into our, our our nations. Actually, you know, I'm 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 English. Um, I, I like being English. I think there's a lot of good stuff in this country both today and in our history i think that it's an incredible place to be i feel very privileged to be here uh, i don't think that it's inherently evil or bad or something to be ashamed of um absolutely not uh, and i think that you know we we as a nation need to need to get get our get our get our shit together um get organized get the basics right you know the real simple fundamental basics about you know things i just talked about you know like having a a reliable food supply um having an education system that isn't just about indoctrinating um you know uh corporate employees have a health system that is actually about making people healthy um rather than treating people who are sick which is what we currently have today uh, have a, a financial system which is actually about uh, 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 enabling commerce and uh, protecting um, the creation of uh, generational wealth rather than just being some kind of scam which is what central banking is currently yeah, it's like a rigged casino um and and just uh, and uh, and uh, build and build back and build back out, and I was doing. I always say build back better because that's obviously been, that's obviously been <laughs> that's obviously been stolen by someone else. But he's kind of, he's kind of the right sentiment. It's just that obviously not in the way that they want us to do it, no. you know. And, and also understanding like we we've been massively demoralized, and we've been sitting through decades now of this sort of real anti-British, anti-English, anti-Western. Everything's bad uh you know and all the sort of fallout from the brexit vote and mm-hmm. people just constantly whinging and moaning and complaining it's like okay that attitude is just going to make things worse for a start and it's, it's also completely ignorant of the huge huge wealth and depth of culture and technological um uh, knowledge and innovation and and um the intellectual prowess and uh, the incredible architecture and, um, you know, the, the cities that we have in this country and the amazing, like the country, so like all of the assets that we have um, as a nation and as individuals and families and communities within that nation need to be marshaled towards sustaining us for the long term and for rebuilding our civilization. And I'm not suggesting that we need to, you know, become an imperial power again or anything like that and start trying to project our power around the world and, you know, doing all those things that, you know, we, well, we are actually still doing today, but we were doing much more aggressively during the, the era of the, of the British Empire. Um, but, you know, this idea that we're just going to live through managed decline and everything's just going to be a bit shit from now on and people should just get used to it and... Uh, so no i don't want that i, I want to i want to feel like the future is going to be better it's going to be brighter and 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 that we actually have an active role in making that so and 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 if that's the case then let's get to it you know mm-hmm. um and uh, and that's down to that's down to all of us no one's going to give us permission the people at the top certainly don't want us doing it so we gotta we gotta we gotta write our own brief here and you know, I think that most most people know just looking around your local area what what the useful things would be to do. Um, and let's let's go at it, and let's um let's build, and let's let's patiently invest in our futures, and um, you know, the, the let's and, and and then inevitably, the world in five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years will be a lot better than it is than it is today. You know. Yeah. Well said, mate. Well said. I did want to leave it on a on a hopeful note, so that's uh, that's well done. Good. Um, I, yeah. And if you and if you want and if you if you like the idea of that kind of thing, then the place where I talk about that is pattern18.substack.com. 
so i've got my my two things that i do that are, are about um taking down the evil powers but for a lot of people that can get a little bit depressing mm. so i also do a separate thing which is about how do we how do we decentralize and build back a new system that so that's works pattern the, you said yeah yeah pattern p-a-t-t-e-r-n yeah. one eight dot substat dot com pattern 18 dot substat dot com okay i'll put these links in the show notes or if you just send them over to me once we're done then i've, I've got yeah them. good stuff all right ben what a rip uh yeah almost yeah, two and a half hours i hope most of the listeners are still with us at this point and uh and didn't turn off halfway through and um <laughs> in a bit of despair because there is hope <laughs> and just remember that you are being divided um purposefully by mainstream media by uh by the messaging that you hear all of the time brexit was an incredibly powerful moment for for them to divide the country and then they have the generational wars as well on top of that they're trying to divide boomers from Xers and Xers from millennials and millennials yep. from zoomers it's going across the whole spectrum there is a reason for that we need to stay uh vigilant we need to stay together having conversations like this not afraid to expose those that are doing it and um thanks for your work man thanks for thanks for coming on the podcast thanks for coming on the scene thanks for you know having these conversations and and not being frightened and, and just sitting there and, and doing nothing so yeah big uh kudos to you thank you it's been a pleasure it's a great way to start the week yeah exactly talking two hours of conspiracy theories yeah <laughs> exactly all, all right, right good we'll take care yeah fantastic thanks for your time and thanks to everyone who's listened in it's been great to be here cheers mate cheers bye